participants. Uh, I am introducing uh, Laura Madella, Dr. Laura Madella, who holds a BA in Italian Study and Philology from the University of Parma and received a PhD in History of Education uh, in Rome, uh, in Roma 3 in 2018, uh, with a dissertation on the Hispanic heretic uh, Jean de Valdez. She studies texts and documents of early modern Europe related to schooling and educational frames. During the last spring semester, she's been a fellow at Boston College, and she's currently a research assistant at Parma University. And today, she's presented two papers, one also on behalf of uh, her supervisor, right? Uh, but her own paper uh, title is The More the Years, the Less the Food. The matter of quantity in Luigi Cornado's writings on this sober life. So you have 20 minutes. Uh, just a, just a short note, uh, we are going to have question times all together at the end. So you're going to talk for 20 minutes, then we're going to switch to the next speaker, and that's it. Okay. Oh, well, again, uh, we, we, we just uh, with your uh, invitation, uh, we send them to the music and talk about uh, metrical body, metrical health, and measurement and so on. Well, uh, first of all, I think, uh, I seriously think that the modernization of the body has ever succeeded. And, uh, but we, every time we afford the great uh, new year, a great new mood of the event, uh, in this case, uh, uh, I need mean to work with uh, information, digital technology information, we feel uh, a brand uh, to be the first one and to deal with the brand new way to do uh, things. Well, maybe it's uh, not always also brand new. And moralization in this case is a phenomenon. Moralization of the body, you know, the quantities of the body is a phenomenon who has always existed in the history of the cultures at least uh, in the history of Western uh, and Eastern cultures. And, uh, and the second point, it interests, even if uh, we are bit, we are so few, and uh, this is familiar, certain kind of familiar situation. So I lose the second point of uh, the connection with uh, the metrical discourse. But so let's start uh, with the start of the day. This is the author of the book which I am going to talk about. He is a Venetian businessman of the Venetian Renaissance, known by two names. The original Venetian name which he used to sign through, and it is Alvise Cornet. And its Italianization, Luigi Cornano. He published his writings as Luigi Cornano. So the Italian name, you know, the Venetian and a bit dialectical one. The, uh, this uh, portrait was made by Tintoretto, who was reaching at that time the age of his career. Thus, his clients and commissioners should be prominent as well. And this picture shows the whole page of a research institute in Padua, which has been named after Luigi Gornaro. It deals with the last frontier of aging from the medical and social perspective and declares to have chosen Bernardo as a protector and patron because of this uh, pioneer, pioneering world uh, in launching, just in power, a positive model of sanity. Let's take a closer look to the work uh, they refer to. The Padua gerontologist uh, referred to the Trattato della Vita Sobria, translated in early modern English as Three Ties of the Temporal Life, or other times, uh, Discourses on the Sober Life. It was published in 1558 when Gornaro was around 64 years old, and it quickly gained success in Italy and outside of it. In Italy, the book sold so many copies that Gornaro was induced to write three treatises more on the same subject. Since then, literature name is writing, literature names uh, is writing discourses one to four. So we have no more Trattato della Vita Sobria, but discourse one of Luigi Bernardo, discourse the second of Luigi Bernardo, discourse the third, and so on. In the rest of the Catholic Europe, Cornell's work became really famous in 1613 as a Jesuit the 
Neologian and Scholar Leonard Lessius translated the first discourse into Latin, attaching it to a treatise of his and using it as an authority of practical wisdom to support his own theories about extending longevity. This is the frontispiece of the second edition because uh, I didn't find uh, on the web uh, the print checks uh, from this piece. Then, as in 1634, Hyjastron was translated, Cornaro's uh, Lessus works, uh, was translated in England, Cornaro was translated as well and reached in this way the Protestant youth market, where it serves, uh, accepted a certain attraction which led him to be retranslated and commented alone, without the protection of the more authoritative lessons. And the English interest in Cornaro last anti lasted until today. In my quotation, I use, uh, um, I use uh, a version of uh, 1905 that uh, reports that uh, um, use uh, all the four discourses and uh, is in a quite, quite more modern English. What kind of text is this? In the author's intent, this is a kind of regime, a regimina, where handbooks of practical advices on hygiene and behavior with a prestigious medieval tradition. The advice involved the, the so-called six non-natural Galenic elements, that is to say, those factors of human life which could influence a man's health and complexion and upon which a man could act. Air, food, uh, they were air, food, drink, sleep and wakefulness, rest and motion, repression and evacuation, and passion of the mind. So some of these factors goes uh, in a couple. Two by two, food and drink, sleep and wakefulness, rest and motion, repression and evacuation. But differently from the traditional regina, Cornaro made his hand distinctively autobiographic, perhaps beyond the real truth, but with a very realistic literary performance and brain, rather uncommon for the topic. Furthermore, he mostly dealt with the category of nutrition and confined the other five factors to a narrow group. Finally, whilst he opened the treatise lesson, declaring to write in order to persuade young and adult men to follow and appreciate temporal life through diet, he gradually addressed his argument toward the elders. The three following discourses written by Cornaro were focused on diet and life expectancy in old age, and it was the same issue to attract the interest of Lessus, who, apart from the theological implication of his writing, addressed this adjustable, added the topic to the titular age. Ad extremum senectutem conservandem. The relation between food and old age in Cornaro's reasoning is mainly seen in terms of quantity and proportionality. Firstly, just after the terse and conventional incipit, in which uh, he goes straight to the point, the author introduces the moral dimension of the question. Three evil customs have gradually gained a foothold in our own era. The first of these customs is adoration and ceremony, the second is everything. And the third is intemperance. These three vices prevail so universally as to have impaired the sincerity of social life, the religion of the soul, and the health of the body. I underscored a couple of words. Heresy, obviously, is the English form to generalize and neutralize the 16th century attack against Protestants, an attack that was frequent as well as rhetoric in Italian text the uh, Italian writings of uh, the second half of the 16th century. And so uh, Cornaro wrote uh, Lutheranism, not a general heresy. Then uh, we have temperance. In the English translation, intemperance applies to the general excess, both physical and moral, but also to excess in eating and drinking. The original Cornaro's text had the crapula, closer to the English crapulence, and it referred uh, purely to gluttony, to excessive and drinking, and to its uh, debauched uh, consequences. The location of the statement in the open makes the concept more pervasive. Just like deceit and falsehood in public life, and just like deceit and falsehood in faith, crapulence is morally evil, 
and as a consequence, let, uh, let, all, let uh, one own bodies be shattered by excess. It's evil too. It is clear that the doctrine of temperance and God and mean was even older than the written tradition of the regime in Asanitatis. Cornaro knows it very well and we state that the benefit of moderation in eating had been proved from the ancients who held it for a moral and medical virtue. Galen, great as physician, led it temperately, led it, that's to say temperate and orderly life, and chose it as the best medicine. So likewise did Plato, history, Hippocrates, and many other famous men in times past. At the same time, the author found in the ancients a book to relate the problem of crapulence with the public life. Plato himself living the temporal life. Nevertheless, he declares that a man in the service of the state cannot lead it, because he is often compared to suffer heat and cold and fatigues of various kinds as well as other hardships, all contrary to the temporal life." End quote. Plato, for sure, had in mind a different service of the state in comparison to the early modern reality. But Cornaro had experienced the public life of the Republic of Venice, where men actually traveled the seven seas and fought hard for money, for trade, for war as well. Lepanto was yet to come. It is worth the point that which Cornaro was a well-learned man but a businessman and not a scholar, and not a physician, and not a philosopher as well. He had drive, thanks uh, to his skills uh, in hydraulic engineering. He drained the Venetian lands by the sea and the mouths of the river, and not to talk about today and in the last week uh, more than ever. So he has not an academic uh, um, canonical learning. But he blamed the social life as society seemed to reverse the moral value of excess and motivation. So he used Plato to attack the, his contemporary, the, the, the contemporary attitude of uh, his contemporary society to comply with the, the virtue of moderation. I quote, for, though, for though it is well known by all that intemperance proceeds from the vice of Plato and temperance from the virtue of restraint, Nevertheless, the former is exalted as virtuous thing and even as a mark of distinction, while temperance is stigmatized as scorn as dishonorable and as defeating the misery alone. These false notions are due entirely to the force of habit. So the philosophical habit will become a second nature. In the Renaissance, the culture of receiving and hosting had become fundamental not only at the courts of princes and noblemen, but it, has, it was a habit gradually acquired from any group of people who needed to entertain formal relationships. And these habits required the generosity. Scarce food, scarce beverage, a thrifty banquet would be called as unrespectful. Abundance, lavishness, and excess were not so easy to distinguish, and even when they were, they were preferred to sobriety. Crapulence proceeds from social habit, you restate it more and more time. I quote, and this truly moral darkness of thine, O Italy, now so commonly the custom feasts are so great and intolerable that the tables are never found large enough to accommodate the innumerable dishes set upon them, so that they must be heaped one upon another almost mountain high. Must we not brand them as so many destructive battles? Who could ever live amid such a multitude of disorders and excesses? As if to say that moderation in eating is good, but its classic moral value is not attractive enough for the social daily life of that time. Cornaro must make it more attractive. So he relates the moderation in eating to the moral quality best suited that time's reason. I quote, to live in accordance with the simplicity of nature, which teaches us to be satisfied with nature follow the ways of holy self-control and divine, and divine reason, and to accustom ourselves to eat nothing but that which is necessary to sustain life. Again, in a being endowed with the reason, the desire of life and health possesses greater weight than the mere pleasure of doing things that are known to be harmful. Divine reason is not the reason of God, rather 
the human quality that brings human beings closest to God, thus the most valuable quality of the Renaissance man. Soon after the argumentation of the viciousness of crowdless and the goodness of the nature, longevity enters again. The author introduces the old age in a positive way, opposite to the youth and the adult age. I quote, a number of young men of the brightest intellect, who are well aware that intemperance is a fatal vice, could I have seen their fathers die for these effects in the flower of men, while on the other hand, that, uh, pardon, there is a type, that behold me still hail and flourishing, they behold me still ill and flourishing at my great age of 83 years. End quote. The younger ill and death, and the elder ill, healthy and death. And the praise of old age goes on through a strategy of overturning, since Cornaro shows longevity as a stage of life totally good. Firstly, it is good because nature allows it, and everything that nature allows is for the man's sake. Nature, nature does not deny us the power of living many years. Old age, as a matter of fact, is the time of life to be most better, as it is then that prudent is best exercised, in the fruit of all the other virtues us enjoyed, it, and passions are subdued, and so on, give itself up fully to reason. This statement does not correspond, for example, to Galen. Statement. Galen in the Marasmus stated that aging was no natural factor but rather an inescapable disease that jeopardized the humoral balance and thus the body function. But I would like to reach the matter of the proportion. So, Cornaro's discourse develops quick and the two factors are put together, thus temperance as a career of the noble virtues and old age as the perfect stage of life to enjoy those virtues. That the nature is satisfied with little, and that with me it is an obsessive habit that long since becomes second nature. And until furthermore, that this is was is that it was in harmony with reason that as my age increased and my strength lessened, I should diminish rather than increase the quantity of my food, since the digestive powers of the stomach were also growing weaker in the same proportion as my vigor became in bed. The capacity of the stomach to digest, to concoct the food. Less than two times, as it is explained technically and in a Galenic way, the need to gradually diminish the assumption of food and beverage while growing older, and to increase the numbers of men, more and more like a child who has to eat many times during the day. In other passages of the first and third discourse, it also suggests a specific quantity of food and drink, and uh, his friends attack and blame him to be a liar because uh, he would have uh, uh, declared uh, uh, more or less food. We have uh, here all the virtues of sobriety that brings to reason once again. And, okay, a peculiar, um, peculiar tract of Cornell's writing is uh, the reading of uh, the death. And so, a sober life grants uh, old men uh, a better way to die. To pass away without pain or difficulty and of mere exhaustion of the radical moisture. For if in them the end is caused merely by the failure of the radical moisture, such is death which without playing the poet alone deserves the name of death as arising from the natural soul. Eating soberly allows to die from the consumption of the radical moisture, then is completely in the natural way. And as nature is good as much as possible, such a death is by definition so good as well. And it is painful and less as, as less as possible. But this way, Kurnan triggers a further of cause. The most desirable death, according to the religious moral, has nothing to do with pain less than cheapness, rather with physical and spiritual pain. Ode, the a finally ode to sobriety, to gentle and moderate things. So right it purifies the sense, it lightens the body, it is the intellect, choose the mind, make the memory the choose the motion swift, action ready and prop. And so and so on. To brief uh, resume my conclusion, Cornaro was neither a physician nor a philosopher, although he knew for sure the fundamental theories of 
Portugal. And the philosophical trend of Paolo Aristotelism, who tried to to put uh, Galen closer to the Christian and Catholic uh, reading of the soul. He was imbued, furthermore, of literature, music, and architecture, that is what we are just mentioning, and he was imbued, uh, for sure, of civic ideas. His writings show how, during the 16th century, medical humanists spread into the layman and ran through the practical wisdom, maintaining some specific reference to Galenism and the philosophical debate around it. The quantitative dimension of nutrition and body developed in those writings cannot but recall some tricky question of today. Firstly, the idea of a sustainable longevity for the elders, their families and society. This is, for instance, the field of action of a visit coronary association we've seen before, and of a growing branch of medical, social and psychological sciences. And secondly, not less important, the ethical value of quantity or scarcity in the universe of nutrition, cookery, body reception, and social life, even from an aesthetical point of view. Thank you. Um, so, big thanks for your talk. I give you some time in between the next presentation. Uh, I, I do it as the last one, if you don't mind. Like to switch a little bit. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so I can have five minutes more. Uh, I like to So it is my pleasure. Oh, okay, we have to yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Nice to see uh, Maria Angela which is uh, who's a senior colleague uh, of mine at the University of Oscar in Venice. Uh, her research focuses on the relationship between metaphysics, uh, theology and epistemology, especially in relation to Melbranche and Leibniz. Ah. And her current interests are the connection between metaphysics and science in the 17th century and the place of rationalism in the history of federation. Uh, she recently published two books. Uh, uh, one is called Magbanch uh, in Rome, which is, has been published this year, and a 2011 uh, uh, Determinism History of Anelia. Is that? Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. And this is yours. Oh, yes, but I'm going to and we have a YouTube. Uh, <laughs> 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 and the title of our talk today is The Rise of Quantitative Biology in the Cartesian Age, the Theories of Reformation. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry for considered in uh, quantitative terms and uh, 
So I want to start with uh, one of with the, the most the, the philosophers of mechanism, uh, the philosopher that even uh, today this morning uh, was evoked evoc as uh, one of the most important uh, figure in uh, this. Uh, uh, kind of uh, questions, it is the card. And um, this is a very well place, well known place, is it is the article 4 of the principles of philosophy, uh, in which the card uh, precisely defined the body uh, as uh, an extended matter. And really, the natural matter or body considered in general consists not in its being something which is hard or heavy or color, uh, or which affects the senses in any way, uh, but simply it means being something which is extended in length, breadth and depth. Uh, as Descartes explained in Article 8 of the principle, the notion of quantity as equivalent to the notion of extension, and therefore, sorry, there is equivalent to the notion of extension, uh, and therefore since extension is the essence of the corporeal substance, which is the matter that constitutes all bodies, the bodies are nothing but a definite amount or quantity of matter, or precisely a definite amount of space. Uh, what distinguishes the bodies, the principle of their individuation and their several features, is motion, which is ruled by a few laws that God established when creating the world. As a consequence, according to Descartes, there is no difference in the nature of a stone, a planet, a tree, a cat, or a human being. Uh, inasmuch as they are all bodies, they are nothing but the defined portions of extension organized by uh, the laws of motion. And uh, um, in this sense, they are all machines. Uh, we can write this, we can read this in um, the treatise on man uh, that Descartes never published in his life, during his life. And uh, here Descartes wrote, all the functions I have ascribed to this machine follow from the mere arrangement of the machine, oh, oh, sorry, of the machine's organ. Every bit, as naturally as the movement of a clock or other automaton, follow from the arrangement of its counterweight and wheels. Against the, the traditional thoughts of Aristotle and also, and perhaps above all, Galen, which was mentioned uh, before, uh, Descartes insists that there is no need to suppose the existence of the soul or, in general, any internal principle of movement and life. Uh, uh, we find this idea here, and I'm sorry I cannot read for the uh, best of time. Um, we will find an analogous uh, um, idea in the later description of human body in 1648. And Kierkegaard wrote uh, the same thing, is that uh, we um, have to deny the existence of souls uh, um, in, uh, within the matter. According to Descartes, not only the functioning of the beings, but also the generation can be given a mechanical explanation. Uh, it's worth noting that Descartes never gave uh, an ultimate word on the animal generation and seems, seems to be aware of the complexity of the subject. Um, there is a lot of different uh, um, places in which Descartes tried to demonstrate that we can explain also, uh, for example, the human generation in mecha mechanistical terms, but then it's, uh, he never gave. Uh, this, uh, uh, this solution as a definite, defined solution, an intimate solution, and the most important work that he wrote on this subject, the so called first thoughts on animal generation, despite its title, are um, probably, written, were probably written after 1648, and then uh, before, or not so much before, uh, Descartes left. Uh, and they were published in the castle. Um, in some places, anyway, he appears to be sure that an organized being can emerge from a state of 
disorganized matter. For instance, in this passage, in which uh, Descartes um, sees no problem in uh, the family spontaneous generation. However, Descartes' contemporaries this not, did not share his confidence in the mechanical explanation of every phenomenon. Pierre Gassendi, for instance, even without knowing Descartes' treatise on man, another physiological work, um, cast a lot of doubt on the fact that mechanism could give reason to living beings. Um, this is because, according to Gassendi, in order to understand the realizations of plants, animals and human beings, we have to suppose a principle that represents the end of a certain being, part of the being, since living beings require an end to be explained. Um, sorry, since living beings require an end to be explained, uh, the research for the final causes cannot be eliminated from the study of the nature. Uh, as he says, uh, you will say that it's uh, the physical causes of this organization and arrangement which we should investigate and that it's foolish to have recourse to causes rather than to active causes or materials. But no mortal can possibly understand or explain the active principle that produces the observed form and arrangement of the vase, for instance, which serve as the opening to the vessels in the chambers of the herd. This is uh, that, uh, an example you heard that Descartes had used a lot of time. And um, it's interesting to note that Descartes replied to um, Descartes replied to Gassendi's criticism only by underlining that we cannot know God's proposals. Uh, the point you make to defend the notion of a final cause, uh, Descartes said, should be applied to efficient causation. Uh, the function of the various parts of plants and animals makes it appropriate to my part and it's their efficient cause to recognize and verify the craftsman through examining its works, but we cannot guess from this what purpose God had in creating any given thing. Descartes does not mention here the internal finality that Cassandra called into question, but identifies the finalist and the notion of function with the efficient causality of God. This probably depends on the fact that in Descartes' view, admitting an internal finalism implies to admit an internal force or power, a soul which autonomously organizes matter. External finalism, however, could be compatible with the denial of this kind of principles and then with mechanism. In this sense, as can be very much already noticed, uh, Descartes' notion of the machine seems to imply, or at least, at least not to exclude, the notion of finalism. The point being that since we cannot know God's causes, mechanism remains the only legitimate way to explain natural phenomena. Therefore, it's not surprising that Cartesian philosophers who admit that we can have access to the mind of God, such as Blanche or Pierre Simbara Regis, who deny the access but not the knowledge of the way in which God created the world, those philosophers try to overcome Gassendi's objection on the difficulty to explain organization, the organizations of the living beings without referring to finance, specifically to a peculiar form of external finance that can be compatible with magnet. They, they try to, uh, to, to make compatible mechanism and explicitly compatible uh, mechanism and finance. Uh, how? With this uh, theory um, called the preformation theory. That is a, a so to speak, biological theory uh, that we will see. Um, in, this, in the first part, I will uh, discuss Manraj's conception, in the second part, uh, Regis. <coughs> so, um, Descartes' analysis of the human being is not marginal in Manraj's philosophy. In fact, Manraj became a philosopher precisely after he met Descartes' physiological writings. Um, there is this uh, legend, in a sense, uh, that uh, um, Manraj was uh, walking in Paris and uh, um, went in a library and uh, in a sorry in a bookshop, and he, he saw this book, the Treatise on Man, and he has 
mass of computation or uh, moved by this, uh, by doing all these uh, physiological treaties. And um, the scholars, of course, uh, uh, discussed a lot why uh, the my brush has had this uh, reaction. And some states that stated that uh, um, the reason was because uh, um, the thesis of man uh, proves the dualism and then uh, can be used uh, for uh, projecting scopes. The others, um, some other scholars like Andrea Robinet, um, stated that Malbranche, uh, the reason is that Malbranche had not only a religious but also a scientific vocation. And the proof of this, I agree with Santina, um, is the, the, the books that um, Malbranche quotes in um, his uh, first uh, great book, The Chasse de la um, For instance, that my piggy uh, on the formation of the. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Um, this is my brush. Uh, I forgot. Um, sorry, my piggy is on the formation of the chicken, the hack, and spammer them uh, the miracle of the nature or the structure of the female, female uterus. Um, thanks to a new instrument, the microscope, the two anatomies, uh, using different experiments and with different aims, show the centrality of the egg to explain animal generation. More importantly, for our topic, they suggested that the future animals were already contained their germs, which eventually would develop in their de definitive form. Since the first edition of this research, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> they changed. Malbranche uh, enthusiastically adhered to this perspective. The main reason for his initial adhesion appears to be because of the Cartesian idea of matter as an infinite extension. As we read in the section on the research dedicated to the errors uh, of the site, uh, with magnifying glasses we can easily see animals much smaller than an almost invisible grain of sand. We have seen some even a thousand times more. These living atoms walk as well as other animals, legs and so on. Without these, it's impossible to conceive how they should live, nourish themselves, and move their tiny bodies from place to place according to the various impressions of objects. Our imagination, my branch continues, gets lost in this small universe. And so does our sight, which has a very limited perception of the matter. But our intellect can help us by showing its true idea, an infinite Cartesian extension, which can, which can then be infinitely divided. Uh, we have a clear mathematical demonstration uh, of the infinite visibility of matter. Okay, and um, in, which, in this idea we can. Uh, see smaller and smaller animals to infinity. One of the consequences of this notion of matter is that we can apply to every living being what we see with regard to the tulip. That is, the fact that the seed of tulip seems to contain all the parts of the growth plant. And uh, here we have the definition, the main uh, position of the, uh, the so-called uh, uh, theory uh, of uh, Sorry, the theory is embodiment de germe, that we can translate as an encapsulation theory or pre encapsulation theory, pre existence theory also. An entire tulip is seen in this tulip bowl, and likewise, a chicken that is perhaps entirely formed is seen in the seed of the fresh egg that does not be hatched. Frogs are to be seen in frogs, hex, and still other animals will be seen in the seed. When we have sufficient skill and experience to discover them. But the mind needs to stop, not stop with the eyes, for the mind's vision is much more. Sorry. Five minutes? Oh no, here is a. <laughs> my, my clock is a little broken. Um, okay, uh, last part. My thought is that the famous of the original animals have been created along with all those of the same species that they have begotten and that are to be begotten in the future. Um, so, there is a lot of discussion 
uh, about the grounds of this uh, um, theory and revival of St. Augustine, for instance, of the doctor of St. Augustine, the new discovery, or Wisma. Um, I think that the internal um, circumstances uh, um, on the are uh, at least two. Uh, the first, we said, is uh, the Cartesian notion of extension. The idea that extension can be infinitely divided uh, make, um, makes plausible to think that there are infinite uh, beings in between. The other, um, much interesting for us, um, is the fact that uh, it's impossible, according to uh, my branch, uh, and as well as what we uh, already said, that uh, organized bodies um, are uh, originated only by the laws of uh, motion. Mm -hmm. uh, the laws of nature, and my brush said at the end of this passage, cannot but give them little by little their ordinary group. And, um, sorry. So, um, here again we have this idea in, um, in other uh, in other texts, like for instance, uh, uh, here in the uh, Entretien sur la Metaphysique et la Religion, de la religion um, again, we find this idea that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. <laughs> the quantification of time is worse than the quantification of time. Okay, um, my, my class says 70 minutes. Okay, give, give me five minutes more, please. So, um, the final, the, the, the organization cannot be explained or the branch only uh, through, um, through uh, the laws of moment. And for this, for this reason, we have to um, state to introduce this uh, preformation theory. It is the idea that everything is uh, encapsulated in, uh, every living being uh, is encapsulated in his ancestors. By the way, my branch. Uh, state that uh, even if uh, God intervenes directly in the first uh, um, moments of uh, the life of the living beings, um, he did this uh, through, I'm sorry, uh, um, through a, a mechanical way, a mechanistical way. You see here the, um, the passage that I emphasize. He, that is God, made from the very first of all speeches of the things uh, by means of a wonderful division of a certain portion of matter. Um, for it is necessary always to be well in mind that this by means of movement everything is fighting in the body. So even if God intervenes at the beginning directly, and so finalistically, um, with uh, intention, uh, he do this, he use as a way of doing this, uh, um, the uh, laws of, um, sorry, the, the, the motion. Um, very, uh, I pass very easily on, uh, on uh, Regis. Regis uh, is, um, was considered the prince of Cartesian philosopher. Um, he, he, he traveled around uh, France uh, making conferences, giving conferences on the Cartesian philosophy and he wrote a very monumental work the Cour Frontier de Philosophie Système Général de la Philosophie de Descartes in 1619. Um, and uh, in this uh, work in three tomes, there is a tome dedicated to the metaphysics, uh, sorry, to the physics, uh, in which uh, uh, again uh, um, Regis, Regis follow, uh, follows Descartes and uh, um, it seems uh, um, here you, you, you see he said that uh, the bodies are nothing but the extension and so on. And it talks also about um, the plants and the animals. And here we find this uh, strange, uh, strange sentence because Regis said we will not have problems in attributing to plants a soul and a life since we see that they contribute a lot by themselves to nourish and to preserve themselves. So, Plants to have the living beings are different, seems different, but uh, this life, the life of plants, consists only in the arrangement of their essential organic part and in particular in a particular disposition of the force, etc. 
Um, so uh, also um, also religious uh, uh, makes the same objection that is that we cannot understand finance but without uh, uh, thinking to intentions to an end to some kind of uh, organization uh, tested organization but um, he uh, again describes this organization this finalistic organization in a mechanical effect. I conclude, uh, as uh, well, sorry, um, he states that uh, plants have been formed at the same time and they are comprised one with the other. So he um, shared a performationism view of the origin of the, the living beings. Um, I conclude with uh, um, With this uh, idea. Um, in the already mentioned classical work, Les Sciences de la Vie, uh, Jacques Roger claimed that despite his intention, preformationism is a true and real betrayal of the Cards project. The main reason being that preformationism abandoned the Cards attempt to explain nature only through natural principles and resorted to using God to save the phenomenon. In this sense, contrary to the card mechanism, sorry, contrary to the card mechanism, reformationism, reformationism is a supernatural theory par excellence. I quote from Andrew Pye that follow Roger. Supernaturalist, supernaturalist theory. In my opinion, this interpretation does not consider two points. The first is the role of God in the card's philosophy. Even if Descartes thinks that there is an abyss between the human mind and the domain of God, as the famous doctrine of the creation of eternal truth implies, in his explanation of the physical world, God plays a pivotal role. It's important to remember that God's attribute of immutability is the reason for the content of the laws, and that in the world, Descartes describes the way in which God creates. If appealing to God to the reason of the first state of the universe, means introducing supernatural arguments into natural explanation, therefore the cartoon can be accused of supernaturalism. The second point is that both my brother Regis and in general all those who adopted the card's method have a precise notion of nature in mind, a notion according to which nature is a geometrical space with no intrinsic power. Bodies are mere configuration of space, pure quantities, whose unit depends on something other than itself, motion. Reformationism only states that in some cases, in regard to living beings, the configuration of bodies, the fact that bodies are not a defined quantity of matter, is not the result, the result of the general laws of motion, but rather the starting point of a particular motion impressed by God. The aim is precisely the opposite of what Roger, Roger Pine stated. It's so is sorry, to naturalize the world, even in its apparently irreducible being, the, the living beings. By depriving the nature of all entities, substantial forms, souls and forces that represent uh, here something divine in all the bodies. When I finish I have uh, when in the 18th century new supporters of vitalism, such as Leibniz, were returned to the scene, they will try to neutralize these kinds of entities and the criticism they have previously received, precise by mechanism, precisely by finding new ways to quantify them. I'm referring, for instance, to Leibniz dynamics. But this is another story. And thank you.
in Italia, tra quantificabile e inquantificabile il corpo nelle indagini mediche di Xavier Duchat. Uh, Fiorella is a PhD candidate at the University of Napoli, Federico II, and works with, on a project on entrepreneurs and the protection of the body. And she's, she's also visiting student at the uh, Johannes Gutenberg University at Mainz. Um, I don't know, how many people are here? Uh, I'm going to dalle ricerche fisiologiche del medico Zerri Biscià e l'idea diciamo, di, di corpo che tra fare dei suoi studi oscilla tra la possibilità e l'impossibilità di misurare l'organismo umano e conoscere un corpo significa per Biscià analizzarlo e analizzarlo vuol dire scomporlo nelle sue parti da esaminare isolatamente per poi decomporle e per cercare gli elementi che rendono possibile la loro Analizzare quindi per Bichat significa cercare insieme ed è proprio questo insieme e la sua precisione che secondo il medico francese sfugge alla quantificazione. E vissuto soltanto 30 anni dalla 1751 alla 1802, nonostante la giovane età, Bichat è considerato tra i fondatori dell'istologia per i suoi studi esposti nel trattato delle membrane e nel trattato della mia scrittura. È inoltre ritenuto uno dei fondatori della moderna medicina, in particolare per aver sostenuto la necessità di pubblicare incinitamente la pratica medica con elemento teorico e nella cultura didattica e in quello dell'esercizio della medicina. Soprattutto per questo motivo, il chef Foucault, nella nascita della clinica, considera Bichat uno degli iniziatori della clinica pedagogica, che contribuisce alla svolta della medicina nel Settecento. E infatti, se in un primo momento le lezioni di anatomia, erano per lo più in letture di testi anatomici, commenti e disegni e dissezioni con dei suoi maestro di Bichat e Bichat si assiste ad un'immersione di rotta nella pratica medica, poiché le lezioni di anatomia e fisiologia sono ottenute servendosi non più di corpi disegnati, ma utilizzando corpi dei, talvolta gravemente malati, talvolta morti. E quindi per Bichat l'elemento operativo è indispensabile per fare di quello sperimentale e teorico. Nessuno dei tre da solo ha valore per la medicina. E nel discorso preliminare al trattato di anatomia descrittiva, Bichat è molto chiaro al riguardo, scrive infatti, operare le sezioni in anatomia, fare esperimenti in fisiologia, scrivere malati e aprire cadaveri in medicina. È un po' da triplice via, al di là di cui non è possibile avere né un anatomista né un medico. E oltre a essere considerato tra i fondatori di fisiologia e della moderna medicina, Bichat è considerato anche come un medico dai cui studi traspare una fisiologia filosofica, soprattutto perché è portatrice di un metodo, di una precisa visione della vita e del vivente umano, a tal punto che si potrebbe parlare di una fisiologia antropologica. Questo aspetto sarebbe stato notato tra gli altri anche da Arthur Schopenhauer. Ora, il nuovo modo di intendere e praticare la medicina da parte di Bichat si riflette anche in un peculiare modo non solo di esaminare, ma anche di intendere la corporità. Uno degli aspetti rilevanti dell'interpretazione di Chatea del corpo è che, sebbene egli corrobori continuamente la possibilità di conoscere il corpo umano attraverso la scomposizione in parti e funzioni, la misurazione, il calcolo, nello stesso tempo Bichat ritiene che una tale conoscenza resta comunque parziale e incompleta per diversi motivi. In primo luogo perché la misurazione, in senso ampio di quanto costituisce il vivente, non è mai una misurazione fissa, costante, ma, ma varia continuamente per innumerevoli cause e condizioni, legalità, clima, uso cognitivo. In secondo luogo perché per quanto la misurazione possa essere precisa, la precisione non sottintende una definizione completa di ciò che si sta misurando ossia la somma delle più precise misurazioni non restituisce una conoscenza altrettanto precisa del corpo, ma fornisce soltanto una qualche conoscenza. E questa impossibilità di conoscere pienamente ed esattamente il corpo attraverso le misurazioni si rispecchia anche nell'idea di Chatean, secondo la quale la sola medicina non basta, per quanto cruciale, per provare a comprendere che cosa sia il corpo umano. E quindi è necessario che il sapere medico consideri anche altri saperi, e quella che diciamo anche un biologo per Cardanini definisce scienza del mondo è pensata infatti come
come un insieme di più discipline dialoganti tra loro, il cui centro è la medicina. Emblematico a riguardo del discorso preliminare che Bichot scrive in occasione della fondazione della Société Médicale de Innovation e di cui riporto un, un estratto. Appassionati della nostra arte e della medicina, abbi nuove conoscenze, vorremmo costringere tutte le scienze umane a pagare il giusto tributo alla medicina. Così abbiamo le lettere che esse possono gettare fiori su una scienza sublime e bella. Abbiamo le scienze matematiche perché si formano uno spirito di metodo e di analisi. Abbiamo la morale perché senza di essa sia dell'uomo solo una conoscenza imperfetta, grossolana e materiale. Abbiamo la fisica perché noi stessi siamo un elemento del grande sistema del mondo. Abbiamo la chimica perché obbliga la natura a rivelarci i suoi segreti e i suoi profondi misteri. Abbiamo la storia naturale, con una parola, abbiamo la filosofia universale perché siamo convinti che una teoria medica sarà più stabile, meglio costituita, se più strettamente si identificherà con la scienza generale e con la medicina pratica e solo un corollario o un applicazione. Tuttavia, studiando le tutte, cercheremo di sottrarci a eccessi estremisti. Ora, diciamo, ritornando invece alla possibilità di misurazione o parziale del corpo, quindi quanto um, si proverà a far emergere che tutto per il il corpo organico risulta in ultima istanza inquantificabile, sia rispetto a ciò che effettivamente si riesce a calcolare, che comunque muta costantemente, sia rispetto ad altri corpi, i corpi fisici, più propriamente misurabili. E non vi nulla di analogo, avrebbe detto Bichat nel discorso sullo studio della fisiologia, tra i tubi inerti dell'idraulica dell e i condotti viventi. E mh, avrebbe specificato ciò non solo per indicare la differenza tra i, i, i due diversi tipi di corpi, ma anche per invitare a utilizzare un linguaggio diverso, propriamente fisiologico e non fisico, per riferirsi al corpo umano. E l'idea della specificità del corpo vivente, dell'impossibilità di quantificarlo al tutto cielo, emerge in particolare nelle ricerche fisiologiche sulla vita e la morte. Divise in, in due tomi, il primo dedicato alla vita e il secondo alla morte, le ricerche si aprono con la definizione della vita quale unione, ensemble, delle funzioni che resistono alla morte. Definizione che, secondo Claude Bernard, autorizza la operare di Schaffer e Vitalisti, che pongono il principio della vita non in un principio materiale, ma nel greco stesso della materia. E la vita è quindi pensata da Bichat come un insieme di forze reagenti, opponenti sia alla morte e a quanto minaccia la vita dall'interno e dall'esterno. Inoltre, quella che lì definisce la misura della vita, viene stabilita la differenza tra la forza dei corpi esterni e l'interna resistenza. Ora, posta questa definizione in generale di vita, Bichat distingue una vita interna e una vita esterna. La vita interna riguarda l'insieme delle funzioni vitali e comprende un relazionarsi semplice con l'esterno. Poiché comprende le funzioni strettamente organiche, proprio della pianta e dell'animale, la vita interna è definita anche di vita organica. La vita esterna riguarda invece le funzioni conoscitive e relazionali, proprio dell'animale, in virtù delle quali l'animale conosce e vette e comunica, pertanto è definita anche gli animali. La somma di queste due vite, quindi vita organica e vita animale, costituisce gli elementi essenziali del corpo umano, che comunque, appunto, per Bichat non si risolve in questa addizione. E non soltanto la vita nella sua generalità è pensata da Bichat come insieme di funzioni, ma anche la vita animale e la vita organica sono concepite e descritte come insieme di ordini di funzioni. Il primo ordine di funzioni della vita animale riguarda le funzioni che muovono dall'esterno verso il cervello e il secondo invece comprende le funzioni che muovono dal cervello verso gli ordini della funzione e della voce. Invece nella vita organica il primo ordine di funzioni riguarda l'assimilazione, quindi include anche la respirazione, la nutrizione, la gestione e la circolazione. E il secondo invece riguarda l'espulsione, che comprende le relazioni, le funzioni e la circolazione stessa che svolge entrambe le funzioni di assimilazione e di espulsione. La circolazione è il centro della vita organica, mentre il cervello è considerato il centro della vita animale. Proseguendo con la sua scomposizione puntuale cioè nelle varie funzioni, dalla vita poi in generale le funzioni che caratterizzano la vita umana, Bichat descrive anche le caratteristiche morfologiche degli organi dell'una e dell'altra vita. La vita organica è caratterizzata dalla regolarità e dalla simmetria degli organi che svolgono le sue funzioni e 
infatti due sono gli occhi, le orecchie, le narici, la membrana che ci pesa fuori mi sembra due parti perfettamente simili, il cervello è composto di parti a deforme regolari, viceversa rito organica caratterizzata al contrario da, dalla simmetria e dall'irregolarità. La disposizione di un lato non porta con sé quella del lato opposto, scrive Michel. E infatti il bronco destro riferisce al bronco sinistro, i reni sono diversi l'uno all'altro, eccetera. E questo comporta anche che la vita animale è doppia, cioè di una vita destra e una vita sinistra, indipendenti l'una dall'altra, e che possono spesso reciprocamente. E al contrario, la vita organica costituisce un sistema unico in cui tutto è legato e subordinato a, a tal punto che anziché supprirsi mutuamente, può accadere che le parti vicine possano trasmettersi una malattia. E oltre alle differenze tra le due vite relative alle forme degli organi e al loro funzionamento, sussistono anche le differenze circa la durata con cui le funzioni si esercitano. Le funzioni della vita organica sono continue, non le possono mai, basti pensare a cosa accadrebbe se al centro della vita organica la circolazione si sospendesse per un tempo prolungato. Le funzioni della vita animale sono invece intermittenti, alternano attività e inattività. Si pensi anche ad esempio al bisogno di riposo per il centro della vita animale, il cervello o per un organo di senso dopo un lungo esercizio. Un'altra differenza tra le due vite concerne l'influenza delle abitudini sull'una e sull'altra vita, altre riguardano il primo in vivo e il secondo in muore in sede delle rispettive vite, le differenze dei tessuti, insomma innumerevoli altre. E quindi a partire dalla definizione generale di vita, quale insieme di funzioni imponenti sia la morte, Bichat scompone e analizza le funzioni che compongono un corpo vivo, descrivendo minuziosamente le rispettive caratteristiche. E un metodo analogo di scomposizione e composizione in somma, che Bichat condivideva con Condillac, è usato da Bichat anche nel trattato di anatomia descrittiva, in cui non esamina propriamente le funzioni, ma i tessuti, che individua e distingue in relazione alla classificazione di organi. In entrambi i casi, tuttavia, sia per quanto concerne i tessuti, sia per quanto concerne le funzioni, la somma di uni e degli altri restituisce una descrizione parziale di ciò che il corpo umano sia. Solo per esempio, Bichat omette qualsiasi ipotesi sulle cause prime, non perché è un tempo di cure, ma perché ritiene che pur esistendo non siano individuabili né meno che mai calcolabili. Ora, diciamo, Proseguendo con, uh, con la suddivisione delle funzioni delle, delle ricerche, un altro aspetto che Bichat esamina concerne la sfera emotiva. E secondo il medico francese le passioni influenzano soprattutto, in modo più evidente e quantificabile, le funzioni della vita organica. E infatti, lo spiega che l'ira e la gioia accelerano i movimenti della circolazione del battito cardiaco, il timore al contrario li indebolisce e li rallenta, un dolore altro alla respirazione, la tristezza modifica le funzioni digestive, uno spavento può sospendere il corso della bile, la commozione influisce sugli organi secretori, inducendo alle lacrime, al pianto. Emblema dell'influenza delle passioni sulla vita organica sono anche, per il medico francese, la gestualità e il linguaggio, come ad esempio l'indicare il cuore per esprimere gioia e dolore, le espressioni idiomatiche quali l'essere consunto alla tristezza, l'essere corroso, le rimorsi, l'arte e l'invidia. Espressioni che, scrive Bichat, non sono già metafore impiegate dai poeti, ma espressioni di ciò che trova si realmente in natura. Ora, sebbene tali espressioni corporee manifestino una passione, uno stato d'animo, non per questo, secondo Bichat, è possibile conoscere e comprendere la gioia dalla pressione sanguigna, il dolore da secrezioni di gestione alterate, insomma, una passione da una manifestazione e quantificazione corporea permane pur sempre uno scarto tra ciò che si può misurare e quanto si sottrae a ogni tentativo di misurazione, tra ciò che indica una misurazione e ciò che tale misurazione non può indicare. E questa impossibilità di quantificare, di calcolare esattamente, è una caratteristica propria del corpo vivente che lo contraddistingue profondamente dal corpo fisico. E mh, detto a um, Passiamo proprio nel sottolineare e ribadire la differenza tra il corpo organico e il corpo inorganico e nell'argomentare la specificità del corpo vivo, che è un dilemma che fa salvo aspetti di vitalismo, trascorre proprio uno degli elementi che fa la Bichat in un'intervista. Ritornando invece a Bichat, 
eh, l'impossibilità di mh, misurare esattamente un corpo organico mh, si basa anche su continui cambiamenti di intensità, di energia e sviluppo che l'organismo vive. Il riposo, la fame, l'esercizio, le passioni, eccetera, influenzano perennemente le funzioni di un corpo e quindi anche le leggi vitali che lo presidono, pur avendo la loro stabilità, sono soggette a numerose alterazioni. Cito da delle ricerche fisiologiche sulla vita mondiale. Prendiamo per esempio i fluidi viventi e inerti. Chi potrà dire di conoscere i primi dietro una sola analisi o anche dietro molte paste nelle stesse circostanze? Se analizzi la saliva, la bile, eccetera, prese indifferentemente da tale o tal altro soggetto, dal loro esame risulta la chimica animale, ma non è questa la chimica fisiologica. Essa è, se posso così esprimermi, l'anatomia cadaverica dei fluidi. La loro fisiologia risulta dalle condizioni e delle innumerevoli variazioni che essi subiscono secondo lo stato dei rispettivi loro organi. Che osserà dunque credere di conoscere la natura del fluido delle economie vivente, se io non ho analizzato nel fanciullo, nell'adulto, nel vecchio, nel maschio, nella femmina, nello stato d'animo tranquillo, sotto il turbamento di rotto le passioni, l'instabilità delle forze vitali è stato lo scoglio contro cui tagliarono tutti i calcoli dei medici, medici fisici del secolo scorso. Quindi, mh, diversamente diciamo, dal, dal vivente, il fenomeno fisico ha una regolarità che consente la formulazione di leggi fisiche altrettanto regolari e che permette una misurazione più esatta e completa. Quindi l'invariabilità delle leggi relative ai fenomeni fisici consente di sottomettere al calcolo tutti i corpi fisici. Viceversa, scrive Bichat, le matematiche applicate alle azioni, alle azioni della vita non offriranno mai delle formule generali. Cito, si calcola il ritorno di una cometa, si misurano le resistenze, un fluido soffre che occorre in carne inerte, si può stabilire la velocità di un proiettile, ma calcolare con Borelli la forza di un muscolo, con Cairo la celerità del sangue, con Giurino la quasi eccetera, la quantità d'aria che si produce nei polmoni, è lo stesso che innalzare un edificio solido per se stesso, sulla mobile arena, il quale non posso accadere per mancanza di una base sicura. E quindi, insomma, in ultima istanza, il corpo umano, quantificabile in parte per diversi suoi aspetti, resta tuttavia nella sua totalità per Bishop qualcosa di incalzabile. Such 
first of all, all scholars able to restore and transcribe the original classical works and transmit this knowledge to critics. And then to leaders who want to be a moral example for their subject through the practice of moral philosophy and wisdom in civil life. Of course, things were not so simple and Renaissance society turned to be as violent as, um, and unfair as much as it was cultivated and forward looking. The age of the Reformation and as a, a consequence uh, counter-reformation focused even more on education to propagate their respective religious values and hoping for the regeneration of men through the scriptures, philologically reviewed and rethinking of in this context, the body could be completely forgotten in the discourse on education, focused on the brain and soul in their effort for learning and the implementation of moral discipline. The image of the relation between mentor and pupil, even if Socratic law was coming back on scene, for example in the Ficinian circles of Renaissance Florence, tended to emphasize the intellectual aspects of learning and dismiss the emotional and bodily side of things. Nevertheless, the direct reading of sources gives a different image of the educational discourse, in which the body is in the indirectly but pervasively considered in humanist treatises and later gains center stage with a revival of Galenic humorism in its connection with talents and educability, especially in the renowned work of Juan Duarte de San Juan. The starting point of the reflection can be the pseudo Plutarchian treatise included in the Moralia and known in the Latin version as the Liberis Vitalis. This short text, even if it is loosely structured and fairly unoriginal in its arguments, is by far the most influential educational source of the Renaissance era. Thanks to the late in translation provided by the celebrated Italian preceptor Guarino Veronese, the text was read all over Europe and subsequently retranslated from the original Greek in several modern languages all through the 15th century. Here are other two versions, a translation of the 19th, of the 16th century, and so on. And here, okay, Plutarch von Keronea, and we have a retranslation, and then German element. It is interesting to see how Plutarch begins the treatise with a, with a reference to popular medicine, recalling the necessity of fathers to choose their partner carefully and avoid reproduction when under the influence of alcohol. The point is scarcely developed and abandoned after a few paragraphs, but puts his classical uh, on education under the sign of the body and how it affects morals and behavior. Plutarch goes on elaborating on the allegory of agriculture for education, explaining how hard work and care can overcome even the most inept nature. This will be the point on which later the medical Galenic reflection on education, exemplified by Juan Huarte, will discuss proposing a totally different idea on the limits and potentialities of education. Nevertheless, the body is not irrelevant and the action of education is often represented by Buddha as limiting the natural indebtedness arising from the young body. For example, I shall next pass to the period of adorations and say a few words, uh, very few words about it. But the iniquities of early manhood are often monstrous and weak, unlimited gluttony, theft of power and money, gambling, rebels, drinking boats, love affairs with young girls, and corruption of married women. The impulses of young men should therefore be kept, fettered, and restrained by careful supervision. For life's prime is prodigal in its pleasures, received and in need of comfort. End quote. The harsh depiction of adolescence, the age of intemperance for which education consists <laughs> in repression, is directly connected with its people, that is, with the energy of growth and therefore the prevalence of body on rational nature. The Latin medicine connected this phenomenon with the unleashing of innate while the body started drying from the extreme wetness of childhood, even if, according to Galen, absolute quantity of heat was the same in childhood and adolescence. With Galen's own words in the Temperamentis, 
Thus, after consideration of very many occasions of children, a large number of young men and youths, and of the same child, both as infant and when grown to youth, I have not found any difference in me between childhood and the private life. It is only, as already stated, that in children the heat appears to detach more vapors and also appears cool and pleasant, while in those in their prime it appears light, dry, and not equally pleasant. For much of a child's substance, which is wet, flows away to the outside, but little in the fact of life when it is dry. And cold. This medical theory, with its filiation and influxes, lays at the basis of the whole humanist approach to education. We find the same argument repeatedly in Vergelius, the ingenuous moribus et liberalibus studies adolescentiae, written around um, the four, uh, written at the beginning of the 15th century. And in all treatises more or less inspired to this seminal book. And it, and it managed to influence also Luther's and Melanchthon's works on education and being generally accepted by the disciplinary structure of educational institutions, ruled by the religious orders from the 16th century onwards. Needless to say, this approach is essentially qualitative and, in its humanist rendition, does not give account of individual differences. While Allen was adamant in saying that general phenomena had to be measured always in individual situations, there is no attempt in classifying attitudes or wits according to natural tendencies. The responsibility of understanding individual talents of the pupil was fully given to the educator, whose ability and charisma was being able to change pupil's nature, bringing into global evolution impossible to assess in quantitative terms. In quantitative terms. The testimonies of Vittorino da Feltre for the pupil, even if clearly biased by the admiration for the mentor, give a clear account of the holistic global approach of humanistic pedagogy and its disinterest in quantifying knowledge or abilities. The body was always present, but more to be cured and disciplined and disciplined than to claim its own rights. Vittorino took good care of physical education of his pupils, but the torments and fastings he inflicted on his own body were considered a proof of his exemplarity. Education accompanied the passage from adolescent, adolescent to men, and therefore the fading away of bodily exigences and the progressive dominance of moral philosophy. As is said in the Liberis Educandis, for as regards the care of the body, men have discovered the two sciences, the medical and the gymnastic, of which the one implants have, the other hardness in the body. But for the illness and affection of the mind, philosophy alone is the remedy. For through philosophy and in company with philosophy, it is possible to attain knowledge of what is honorable and what is shameful, what is just and what is unjust, what in brief is to be chosen and what to be avoided. And most important of all, not to be over joyful at success or over much distressed at misfortune, not to be dissolved in pleasures, not impulsive and brutish in them. This, these things are regarded as preeminent among all the advantages which, which accrue from philosophy. The reflection on education brought about by Spanish humanism and its reflection on ingenio helps to explain the development of Juan Guardes theory. Authors such as Rodrigo Sanchez de Jaivaio, Bredis Rattatus de Arte Disciplina, et modo aliendo et erogendo filios pueros et humans, the mid of uh, uh, 15th century, Alonso Ortiz, Liber de Educaciones, the end of the 15th century, Elio Antonio de Nebrija, the Liberis Educandis Liberius, 59, wrote short treatises, all of the Spanish writers, uh, wrote short treatises in which the idea of an individual ingenium is brought up by the references to Quintilia. The teacher or the mentor has the duty to understand the pupil's unique talents and inclination, but no serious instruments are given to perform this difficult task. Arguments are mainly paraphrases of Plutarch treatises, in, and some other classical topic expressing that aims of education one century after Quarino Veronese and Vergerio had changed, but educational culture was in fundamental continuity with the past. 
Here, galenic medicine and the new attention to the body which followed the expansion of anatomic discipline, which at the time was still able to coexist with galenism, came again at the forefront, informing while Quartes examined the ingenious 1571. And through the re-evaluation of this theory operated by the early Jesuit Antonio Mussolini, inspiring the classificatory dispositives of Jesuit educational institutions. On the Reformation side, Melanchthon wrote his The Animal Communitarius. Uh, we are in all translation of uh, Quartus Four, but not Melanchthon. Uh, On the Reformation side, Melanchthon wrote his The Animal Communitarius, 1540-1543. Wittenberg, published in Wittenberg and Basel, drawing heavily on medical sources and affirming that the study of the soul is preliminary ad medical martem, cum natura complexion, et membrorum destin, et inizia ic sum philosophia moralis. Here, the many European translation of art. In this paper, of course, there is no space to develop full blown hypotheses about this phenomenon. Certainly, the transformation of political structures, from the individual familiar manifestation of power to the increasingly centralized and bureaucratic administration of large monarchies, used a reflection of the education of the members of the political elites and posited the necessity of an appropriate selection of talents. Moreover, the religious claim had emphasized the idea of a radical renewal in culture and the necessity of new protocols for educating the man and the subject. An attempt in employing medicine for the quantification and classification of human talent was a possible response to such needs. Again, the base materials of this theory of education were not new. The novelty was the use of medicine to analyze not only character and morals of the pupil, but also his prospective abilities. The consequence of this assumption was the subordination of educator to medical knowledge. Any educational action not following the physical complexion of the was doomed to fail, and the appropriate exam in the ingenious became the most crucial act of all the path towards our Moreover, the harmonious development of, of all faculties, the analogous of Galen, ideal mixture of temperaments, must be abandoned in favor of the development of the one and only talent of the pupil, for his personal achievement and for the improvement of the state. Our new passage in one part that's based in this work states that clearly the point. Um, I avoid the Spanish reading and uh, I put to the end that the words of all artists may attain the utmost pitch of perfection and be of the greatest use of the commonwealth, it seems very reasonable that by a law it should be provided that the carpenter should not interfere with the husband, nor the weaver with the actor, not yet the lawyer pay the physician or the doctor the applicant, but that each should stick close to the profession most agreeable to his talents, and let the rest alone. For considering how short and limited the, the will of man is to one thing and no more, I have been always of opinion that no man could understand two arts perfectly well without proving the fact in one of them, and that accordingly no might uh, err in the choice of that which was most agreeable to the bent of his nature and inclination. There should be trials appointed by the state, men of approved sagacity and knowledge, to search and found the abilities of youth, and after due search, to oblige them to study of that science their heads leaned most to, instead of abandoning them to their own choice. All the ancient philosophers have found by experience that where, nature, that where nature disposes not a man for knowledge, it is in the vain for him to labor in the roots of the art. But none of them has clearly and distinctly declared the, what nature is, which renders a man fit for one or unfit for another science, nor what difference of which is observed among men, nor what arts and sciences are most suitable to each man in particular, nor by what marks they may be discerned which is of the greatest importance. One 
of artist theory elaborates with passion and often with harsh satirical tone on the scarce traces left by Gale in his Quod Animi Moles and Teramenta Sequente. He associates with each predominant individual temperament, hot, humid, hot, dry, hot, humid, and leaving aside hot, dry, associated with the decline and the death. A mental faculty, imagination, intellect, memory, and therefore predicts from temperament the right educational path and future profession for each individual. Of course, the child is always more humid than the angel, and the young culture than the old man. But the humanist idea of a common path towards perfection was opposed in the name of plurality of possible individual and unbalanced perfections. A paradigm of education was changing, while the humanist idea of the cultivated prince had lost its fascination and capable functionaries were required instead. The body needed to be programmed before birth through appropriate reproductive techniques, then carefully quantified and classified along with the individual talent in order to be developed at best. Even if this phase in the history of education did not last long, it opened the path to political and anthropological modernity, contributing to the contemporary perception of human self, its struggle for power, and its <laughs> unavoidable fragmentation. Thank you on behalf of. Uh, 30 minutes, 20 seconds.